for now to all of you. Good morning. <clears throat> and uh, well, to begin with, happy beginning of Kartik, Brat. As you may know, I announced a few days ago that I won't be connected online during Karti Brat. I having my Wi-Fi detox, so to say. So I have recorded this video in advance, knowing that I won't be available during this whole month in what is social media. So as you can see, for the title of this presentation, today is one exact year, at least on the lunar calendar, first day, second day of Kartik, that Tripura Swami rejected me as his disciple. So somehow came the inspiration the need to to share a few reflections with all of you since many of you have been asking also during not only this whole year but recently so where i am internally in connection to all that happened so i felt compelled to share a few words of that for you and for everyone concerned including me hopefully bringing further healing clarity closure and moving forward so how, how the idea for doing this video came, or this presentation, for those of you who are only hearing the audio. When I went, some months ago was, we had the Purusha Tambrat, this most auspicious month we have once every few years. Uh, I was realizing a few, I took a few bows and commitments, and a particular fruit, so to say, that I pray to attain, was uh, developing further closure with this particular situation that happened with Tripura Swami, his mission, and so on and so forth. And I especially pray to, to bring closure in a redeemed way and in a redemptive way with deep, honest, sincere healing. And also for this to happen, I during this whole month of Purusha time, I participated in different retreats and seminars, uh, many of which pointed in this direction, all of which pointed in this direction of healing, acknowledging what needs to be addressed, forgiving, compassion, and at the same time ascertaining what needs to be ascertained and so on. So as a result of that, at the very end of the Purushata month, basically the very last day, came the inspiration while praying uh, of making a presentation like the one I'm trying to do today. But nonetheless, I tried to spend a few more weeks after that figuring if I am actually do, to do so or not. You know? if, 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 and if I'm going to do that, from which place to do that uh, internally. Uh, so it's not a, a thing to justify something in a wrong way to feel myself morally superior or, or whatever. So at that moment, trying to figure out during those weeks, the idea came, <clears throat> this quote came, like you cannot heal something that you don't acknowledge it first. Mm -hmm. So first there is acknowledgement, there can be healing. In other words, before healing, we need to name frame, uh, ascertain whatever needs to be healed, and then address what needs to be healed. And only then can that initial pain, so to say, be not only redeemed, but also hopefully redemptive mm, to others. What, what I, I sometimes like to call redemptive suffering, mm, or, or something that is started as suffering, started as pain, but ended up in, in redemption, not only for the person affected, but for his, her whole environment. Mm -hmm. So that's the main spirit, hopefully I'm praying, that's the main spirit and intention of the words of this presentation, trying to bring redemption, wherever it may be required, mm -hmm. starting for me, not in a selfish way, but acknowledging I have that need. Uh, and hopefully if something can be extended through me, I'm blessed by that happening. So that's why I will be bringing my own personal testimony or example as a tool for that, hopefully, as a tool for extending that to others. And knowing that my particular experience is not, of course, the only case uh, about these particular templates that I will be sharing today. Mm -hmm. And of course, since I will be sharing uh, these words only after having acknowledged what happened to me and trying to have acknowledged that as clearly, as deeply as possible, and also after having grieved mm, about it, after having healed about that, at least on, on some level. Also, I trust that after myself going through such a process, 
I hope and I trust that such healing process that I've gone through will give my own words some power, some influence, if you will, positive influence to create also the same healing effect in those who may be hearing my words and who may be going through something similar. Or even if you are not going through something similar, hopefully witnessing my attempt to be vulnerable and transparent and honest with you may be healing in some way or another. So through the words I'm sharing here, I'm not preaching to the core, as I say, core, nor I'm trying to, of course, convince those who are already convinced about one stance or another or, or, or not trying to convince those who are not willing to hear or, again, those who are already conclusive about their own ver version of this or any particular situation. I'm mostly sharing my words here, these words, as part of my own closure process my own healing process, but also, again, extending my own situation to those who may be going through similar patterns or may be going or have gone or know someone who is going and trying to hopefully shed some light on, on templates that many times in, hi in human history tend to repeat themselves and need to be addressed for what they are, not for what they are not, given that sometimes we tend to forget again and history tends to repeat itself. So to begin with, I'll, I'll let me first of all express uh, deep gratitude, sincere gratitude for the whole turn of events that somehow started a year ago or even a little bit more than that. So I want first of all to be grateful mm -hmm. and to express gratitude for the place I find myself in now at the present moment. It's a place that I would have never found myself if all the things that happened wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. So I found myself in a more spacious, broad, uh, deep place internally. I found myself more committed to the process and, and even more committed to the principle of Guru Tattva, believe it or not. <laughs> so I, I choose voluntarily to, to express gratitude, express thankfulness mm -hmm. to the turn of events and to all of the ones or the people or the individuals who were instrumental for me to find myself wherever I am there. So thank you to all of you. There are many of you, but you know who you are basically. So thank you to all of you. Now, so many things came during this process, This the whole book of radical personalism and the whole idea and the whole series and so many insights coming from that, so many new experiences, new friendships, new prospects, and a whole new version of myself. Hmm? that I feel so blessed with. So I choose to begin and to end, hopefully, my presentation with profound gratitude. Uh, despite having gone the most clearly difficult, the most difficult and painful uh, period in my life, and I had a few more of those as well, <laughs> but despite how difficult and painful it was, the most came from it. And that's generally a pattern in life. Pain opens the heart so much, sheds so much insight. So... Because I'm totally happy, I feel totally blessed to be where I am. Whatever I will share next, um, it's never a complaint of why this happened, why it was done, it shouldn't have happened. And much less it's a reclaiming mm, to be back in any particular situation or group uh, that I have been in the past. It has nothing to do with that, but it's a show of gratitude to all of that, but a deep gratitude to where I am in the present moment. Mm -hmm. So, and at the same time, trying to acknowledge those important patterns that I personally consider <clears throat> that we need to remain vigilant in relation to not only in our Gaudiya Sampradaya, but in humanity at large. Mm -hmm. So, that said, in relation to just having one, one year officially today from being rejected by Tripurai Swami, again, beyond my overall gratitude for all that I learned and received from him, which is a lot, and I acknowledge that, and who I am now also in part is due to the influences and the teachings I received from him. So despite all that, that I try to keep properly in place in my heart, and hopefully I'm making it clear enough to all of you as well, I also keep certain opinions that I shared in, my, in the letter I wrote one year ago exactly, and in the video I share in that connection, uh, which was published on October 10th last year, because second day of Kartik last year was October 10th. Uh, 
So in connection to that and to some things that happen after that letter, I will share a few further additional ideas, not so much to interrupt the healing of the wounds that many other people may be exactly healing in this precise moment, in others or in me even, but hopefully in the mood of further reflection, hopefully further healing in connection to that, I'm not pointing to Tripura Sami as the villain in the movie and me as the hero or the martyr or whatever, but trying to learn from what happened. Because if I don't learn, if we don't learn, we may repeat the same story again. And to observe certain patterns that go beyond this specific situation <clears throat> and which happen in many other places. But I will be using my specific situation because it's all I had on a first-hand experience as an example of more universal patterns that need to be understood and properly addressed. So please keep that in mind so you don't take what I'm sharing just as a personal attack or anything like that, but just resorting to my own personal experience to point at more universal, so to say, patterns. So as I mentioned, as grateful as I am to Tripura Swami, I still feel that what I went through, to, to put it bluntly, was a form of abuse. In this case, called pastoral abuse. Pastoral, maybe you, you are familiar with this term, pastoral abuse, which basically means abuse of power. Uh, about, 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 yeah, abuse of power from someone in a religious context, in some authority, from some religious authority, which in my particular case took the form of a few things, as I already mentioned in the past, ostracizing, uh, shunning, gaslighting, scapegoating, character assassination, false accusations, different forms of man subtle man manipulation, and so on. And in one sense, it was not as worse as it may have been, probably, if I will have complied fully to that situation, which I didn't, and the reject of that was my rejection, basically. So that's pastoral abuse. Again, I'm mentioning this because sometimes some of us have the idea that abuse only means raping a lady or raping a child or being violent physically to someone, which, of course, all of them are forms of abuse and very delicate. But there are many other forms of abuse which, abuse, which may be more subtle, invisible in this case. Pastoral abuse may be one of them. In fact, pastoral abuse is against the law in our secular society. And sometimes we do not put that on the scale properly. And I personally think we should, because if not, we end up probably normalizing forms of subtle abuse, uh, which are equally traumatizing or have the potential to be equally traumatizing than other forms of abuse. So I think for that to happen, then again, we need to redefine terms, rethink what means abuse to us and what's actually abuse. So pay attention, let's pay attention. What's our own idea of abuse? It's only limited to raping or physical violence, or it includes other forms of potentially traumatizing actions, reactions, patterns, dynamics. So sometimes we need to find a language or a way of thinking about certain words, because if we don't have a language for something, then we cannot talk about it, basically. So this presentation and others, it's not the only one what I'm sharing, is in part about it. Let's discover a way to talk about things that we urgently need to talk about. Because again, if we don't have a language to, for something in particular, we are not able to fully talk about it. And I personally think this is something going on, not only in our Gaudiya society, but in religious context at large. So that said, yeah, I personally consider that I've gone through pastoral abuse, the experience of pastoral abuse in some degree or another. Uh, I'm trying to acknowledge that. And well, I don't deny that Tripura Swami has spiritual advancement and, and lots of knowledge. I'm not denying any of that. But also the sudden reaction, or I will say overreaction, that he had with me in such a short period of time from one place to another. For me, it was clear by witnessing that, that, that he, as other people I know, uh, have some unaddressed, unresolved human issues, which... If, if they remain unaddressed, they will end up getting in the way, basically, of how he or others relate to other people or how someone like him will perform his function as a guru, like it happened to me. 
So let me briefly recap what's, what happened. I won't torture you with my 56 page letter that I wrote a year ago, <laughs> but just briefly a few words of what happened and what happened after I shared that letter to why he rejected me. Already again, this was addressed in my video a letter published on October 10th last year for those who would like to check further detail. So where to begin? Because some people still think, and I'm surprised by that, and they told me I was rejected by me considering that Bhakti was not inherent in the jiva and deferring in opinion from him and Brindaranya. But actually, that's not the reason why this happened. That may have been seen as an external trigger, but the actual reason, at least in my opinion, is very different. <clears throat> So, which is a brief timeline of what happened. Well, to begin with, I should say the Tripurari Swami is very biased towards his disciple Rindaranya, his right hand, I will say, uh, with all the potential problems that this entails. A guru being too considerably biased to one, one particular disciple, it has been described by our Acharyas. And Tripurari Swami told me himself and other devotees about his considerable bias, partiality towards her. So that bias took, or maybe takes, but took at least Tripurari Swami to accept basically whatever Brindaranya says about Tripurari Swami's disciples, even without Brindaranya knowing those disciples in person or in detail, as it happened to me. I practically do not know Brindaranya. She doesn't know me, but she presented very specific and strong opinions about me and my motivations which, this is the next part, Brindaranya shared a public series of uh, false remarks and assumptions about me and about the intention behind my words, and Tripurai Swami fully supported hmm, her statements without even consulting me if those assumptions were actually true or not, oh, and, and, and him being quite close that someone may contradict such a version. So when, when I asked Tripura Swami about that, about why he was showing full support to something that was actually not true without even asking me about it. Uh, so I, I asked about that, somehow contradicting Brindaranya's version, Tripura Swami became more and more distant from me and since, I question, since I questioned Brindaranya's accuracy, basically. And indirectly, and without me wanting to do that, I was somehow questioning his own bias what was pointing toward his own bias toward her. So when I, sh and, and then I spoke with Brindaranya, I wrote to her and at one point of the conversation, as you may know, remember, I showed to her how her assumptions were actually inaccurate. And I address each particular one of those. <clears throat> and, and I asked her what she thought, what she thought I was telling to her with, I mean, she thought that what I was telling to her was something that uh, directing to her, but actually I clarified to her, no, it was something that was talking about me. So when I showed that to her, <clears throat> how that happened, how I actually was talking about me, and I asked her basically why you took my words that directed to you, what is clearly that it was about me, immedi immediately Tripura Swami canceled the conversation. He told me that I should stop talking to her and that I will continue talking to her husband. Guru Nista. And then, as you may know, I continued talking to Guru Nista. And at one point, Guru Nista, I questioned some, some of the ways Guru Nista addressed some things we were talking about. And Tripura Swami again canceled that conversation I was having with Guru Nista. So the, the more I ask about this unresolved by, but important issue, mm -hmm. that why I'm some, someone is being is pointing at things that are not actually true and the guru is fully supporting that without any clear communication and feedback. I needed that clarify. I needed to clarify that situation. <clears throat> and I needed to understand why Tripura Swami was taking a bigger and bigger distance from me during all that period. So the more I asked about that, the more distant Tripura Swami became from me. Mm -hmm. And that's an internal distance that not only I perceived, but many other devotees also perceive that as well. So the point is that the more he validated Brindaranya, uh, the more he invalidated me to the point of starting to talk to others about things that I never did actually, you know? Like I was told after I was being rejected, <clears throat> for example, that before he rejected me, Tripura Swami was already talking to some of his disciples behind my back <laughs> about how he knew things about me red flags, he will call. So he knew things about me that those devotees didn't know. 
And he will leave it at that and didn't say too much in detail. And those things were not actually not true. They were not red flags. So somehow it was a way of undermining my position in the view of his disciples. For Tripura Swami also was told he was organizing private online meetings with devotees <clears throat> before his rejection, sharing only his own version of the situation as valid and conclusive, uh, or even writing to other devotees as I received those letters eventually accusing me of things that I never did, you know, like saying like me and others were performing a conspiracy against him. Uh, I don't know that I was deviated or engaged in abuse, betrayal, and some other things in that connection. <clears throat> Sorry. So, of course, eventually this further and further distance uh, took eventually the shape of him rejecting me as his disciple, as you already know. And after rejecting me, interestingly enough, he started to talk to me up to others without using the term Swami. He took away the term Swami from me, although I never broke any of my sannyas vow, vows. So he started to talk to me as Padmanabha only, which I personally per perceive as a further attempt to diminish my position in front of others. And then came all the series of post-rejection defamation, so to say. So at that point, the conclusion that I reached was like, it is not safe to be in a mission where at any moment, uh, one disciple who doesn't know basically anybody in the mission, mostly, can fully define you to the guru of the mission in a very conclusive way. And the guru will take that as totally accurate. And then he will start to re relate to you accordingly, which for me, it's a form of impersonalism, to be honest, instead of a personal communication and empathic listening and openness to hear. So anyhow, that's it. But mentioning all this, and I think I already clarified it, but I would like to clarify it again. I'm not accusing Tripura Swami, nor Brindaranya, nor anyone of being bad people. Mm -hmm. Uh, or, or doing this with ill motive and bad intention. I'm pointing to how, how one can be even spiritually advanced and with lots of knowledge and even a good person. Mm -hmm. But if you have unaddressed human issues or, un, or even unresolved trauma in some cases, you may end up creating situations of abuse, mm -hmm. whether pastoral abuse, any other forms of abuse, even if that was not your original intention. Mm -hmm. Uh, in fact, it is widely known, you can search, do the research yourself, that many of the most traumatic abuses <clears throat> have, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> it is widely known by research that many of the most traumatic abuses were done by good people, not by bad people, by good people <clears throat> who had unresolved human issues. But they were unaware that they were actually indulging in one form of abuse or another. They were just carried by their own <clears throat> unresolved issues <clears throat> and thus perpetrating abuse in one direction or another. So that's why I'm pointing, what, what's, that's what I'm pointing here. <clears throat> that unless those unresolved sections in ourselves, I'm not free from that, are not first acknowledged, the pattern will repeat itself over and over again without us probably noticing that. And this happened with Tripura Swami. Interestingly, this I'm not the only one <clears throat> who went through this situation, but other disciples as well. When I was rejected by him, I was, of course, in a shock, as you may imagine, overwhelmed, surprised, and thinking, like, as, as, as I already shared with some, like, there is basically no press in our Gaudiya history for this happening. So I thought I was the first rejected disciple of Tripura Swami, but then I came to know after being rejected that I was not the first one, that there were other disciples that he also rejected, uh, and many of which wrote to me personally after they getting to know that I was being rejected. That's how I get to know about that. So then I could see like the pattern of rejection uh, that they shared with me, the background to their rejections show a very clear pattern. And they also share with me similar experiences that they 
the Tripura Swami felt that they, these disciples were conspiring against him, Tripura Swami feeling threatened and therefore ending up threatening them somehow. They, that's what they told me, uh, they, that these disciples experienced emotional neglect <clears throat> towards them and other disciples, or they felt that Tripura Swami was in denial of his own faults and mistakes, or that he will get angry at disagreements when disciples will not agree with him. So very similar pattern to situations I've gone through. And that also actually helped me to understand that his sudden overreaction toward me uh, was not actually something personal against me in particular. Basically, I was uh, an instrument, so to say, to trigger something that was that was or is unresolved in Tripura Swami. So I triggered that on that situation, which again came to the surface. Mm -hmm. So in the context of saying this, again, while I'm trying to remain grateful and respectful, to be honest, also I won't buy into any form of uh, cancel culture that sometimes those voices may come from outside in the name of Maharaj, you shouldn't speak about that because that will be fault finding or that will be a parade. No, we, we already know where that weaponizing of these terms takes us. And of course, this has come indeed. I have received some messages in that connection. So interestingly, any critique of power, if someone dares to say something about someone in a position of power, any critique of power is still so counterintuitive for most of us, maybe unconsciously, that most of our, if you pay attention, most of our human and religious history itself has largely avoided critique of power. Try to study it. You can see for yourself. So again, this is in the DNA of our human species. So I think it's important to bring that to the surface. However, something is actually true. There are concrete, clear facts that happen, and we are talking about it. At the same time, with sincere commitment to the truth, with a well-wishing spirit after, after having gone through some process of acknowledging, grieving, healing. Then to do that, to speak about those things is not only not bad, but totally necessary, I will say, and totally desirable, especially probably in the times we are living now. So yes, we should forgive, as I feel personally I've done, but let's not confuse forgiveness with permission. Because sometimes in the name of you forgive him, that gives place for further permission to continue certain abuse. So we can forgive abusers, but we should not give permission for further abuse. Try to see the difference between these two. So in this connection, and as, and as you may imagine for sure, uh, one of the most difficult things I had to go through, a little bit back to my personal testimony, in this particular situation was the following. I was the main basically representative of my guru in the mission and I was loved by the whole Sangha basically. And I loved the whole Sangha basically. And from being in that situation, I was suddenly rejected and stigmatized basically from one day to the other, very suddenly. And very suddenly, I was left without a guru, without the service I was performing to my guru and to the mission. So I was left without a mission, without my guru, without the service I was performing to all of them. And I was left without the identity that I had in connection to all of that. Because my identity, who I was, was a disciple of Tripura Swami, a servant of Sri Chaitanya Sangha, part of that particular mission. So suddenly, my own identity was somehow taken away. So you can imagine the identity crisis I went through. <laughs> Who am I now? Where to go? What to do? And interestingly, or even worse, that was quite shocking. No, Basically, officially, nobody in Sri Chaitanya Sangha was allowed to talk to me from that moment on. Tripura Swami made that clear. He sent some messages that I received where he said, I don't want anyone or any of my disciples to talk with Padmanava Swami. So, yeah, that's called ostracizing, shunning, and so on. So that's pretty intense, pretty extreme, as you can imagine. And I don't want to play the victim. I've been a victim, which is not the same of playing the victim. 
And somehow I've survived this particular situation by Krishna's mercy, uh, seeing probably him seeing my sincere desire to remain a devotee. I mean, that's my desire. And so I feel that he gave the necessary shelter and mercy and inspiration to go on. But the situation in itself that I have just described, I mean, the contrast was brutal from being in one particular situation to suddenly being completely mm, uh, an outcase, so to say. So I can imagine and I can understand, I'm saying this because I can imagine and understand how other people in that same situation may not make it. Mm. And of course, that breaks my heart. And that's why I'm also sharing these words here because I wouldn't like other person to go through that or if they're going through that at least that they may receive some tools or criterion or support on how to navigate those very complex waters so and interestingly what i'm sharing here is not only about me this particular situation did not only happen to me a similar thing happened not only to me but to others also who were members of three chaitanya sangha many of them actually were the main contributors, many of the main contributors to the Sangha and the senior most members of Sri Chaitanya Sangha for decades. And Tripurari Swami suddenly considered them dropouts. And that's how he referred to him, to them, sorry, in a message that I received. So again, these people, most of them, the most senior members of the Sangha, many of them Prabhupada disciples, they supported Tripura Swami with decades of service, donations, uh, support of every type. And Tripura Swami basically stopped talking to them after they supported me in this situation. In one sense, they stopped existing for him. And again, I heard from many devotees in the past that he reacted in similar ways to other people. So as you can see, my point is here, this whole situation is not only about me. It's not that he acted in certain way only with me, but with others also. Mm. So from there, and from there, of course, we can see the same template extended in other situations with other people. And yeah, of course, um, I've heard also some arguments, so to say, or, or justifications in this connection. Some people saying, well, the situation was, was between them two, between Tripura Swami and Padmanabha Swami. As you can see, it was not only between me and him. Some other people were involved and similarly uh, ostracized, but even if you want to take it between him and me, I don't think that's a very honest way of addressing that because the point is, if you clearly notice some symptoms of abuse, that in this case, I think they're very clear, and you remain silent and say that's between themselves, you know, try to, I mean, I'm not comparing fully, but imagine you are in your room and you know in the next room someone, a father is abusing his child, and you say, well, that's between them too. That's not correct. Chaitanya Charitamrita says if you know that there is some situation of abuse or you know about some misdeed and you know about it but do not do anything, do not say anything, you become implicated, you become part, accomplice of the situation. Mm -hmm. Or some other people uh, advise me, again with good heart, well, leave all behind, forget about what happened and just move forward. And of course I appreciate the, the input but at the same time, in order to move forward, first we have to go through. First, you, before transcending or redeeming or being redeemed, at least personally, I feel I have to acknowledge what happened, acknowledge that in detail, acknowledge the effect of that on me, address that as painful, as complex as it may be, grieve, allow myself to go through that grieving period, and only then heal, and only then be redeemed. <laughs> Uh, and move forward. Mm -hmm. Again, the moving forward is by going through all these stages of acknowledging, addressing, grieving, healing, redeeming. Mm -hmm. And something that also affected me and broke my heart a lot is that I've seen that in Sri Chaitanya Sangha, Tripura Swami has not established or promoted himself, addressed himself this type of sequence, has not openly spoke about what happened. There was no place for grieving in the Sangha as a whole, so to say. No public address of the issue in the community, but merely let's move forward and let's continue, which I personally don't feel is the most healthy way because there is still something that needs to be addressed and solved and grieved about and healed and redeemed. So I'm not saying this to further 
churning controversy or something like that. Um, hopefully this is speaking, that's my attempt at least to speak as clearly and sincerely as possible about real facts, real things that actually happen. <laughs> Probably uncomfortable truths for sure, but especially if we find those truths uncomfortable or, or inconvenient, the more then there is uh, a need to name and frame those truths and talk about them openly, not put them under the rough, hoping that they will be magically healed or forgotten. Mm -hmm. The actual question in that case, if we feel uncomfortable about the things we are talking about now here, maybe the actual question would be, why do I feel uncomfortable hmm, in dealing with things that are actually truth? Hmm. Yes, maybe we feel uncomfortable. Again, I'm not free from that. We may be feel uncomfortable or unsettled because those things will be messy. They will be complex. They will be demanding hmm, of change. They will be confronting. But that's exactly how we prove our loyalty mm, to the truth. And by going through all that complexity, all that messiness with integrity and with courage. Mm. And maybe, again, some members in Sri Chaitanya Sangha, maybe they may feel that I'm going back to this topic again, that I'm attacking them because I haven't solved this whole issue in myself. But to be honest, I personally feel that I've been able to solve it at least on a very deep degree. There may be always some remaining layers that I hope to address and heal. But in general, I feel I've been able to resolve, to solve it by going, as I mentioned, to different, not only different seminars and retreats, but of course, by going through the whole situation myself internally on a daily basis for the whole year through prayer, mm -hmm through different sharing, feedback, openness. I even wrote a letter recently through Tripura Summit to bring further closure. And again, by experience, experiencing different healing modalities and, and redemption. So I'm humbled and, and I'm very grateful for the redemption that has come because of all that. And I'm thankful and grateful to all implied there. And as I mentioned to Tripura so in my letter, the, the, inquire, the inquiry, the question that I posed to him at that point were in terms of seva, were in terms of wanting to serve him in the best possible way because I loved him. Mm -hmm. He was the person, I, as I told him in my letter, you are the person that I love the most, madly, <laughs> uh, and, and that helped me the most in many moments in my life, but also you are the person that hurt me the most and that ended up defaming me the most. So that's a very paradoxical and complex combination to harmonize. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and again, I tried to feel immediately forgiveness and well-wishing after he rejected me, as I told him. But also I realized, no, first, I'm being evasive by trying to go there so quickly. So first I need to feel some anger, first some pain, overwhelming emotions, some anger, and so on and so forth. And only then, after that, I can feel forgiveness, true forgiveness, through compassion, through well-wishing. So again, I feel fortunate to be, to feel that I, I am in that place at present. And hopefully I can be even more and more. Some people also have told me, and again, we may ad agree that we will disagree. Like if I were you, Maharaj, I would have done this or that. I wouldn't have done what you did say, what you say. And I respect and I understand that each one is different. And also, of course, it may be, tempting and easy to tell others what one would have done in that situation. But we never know unless we are in those shoes ourselves, unless we are going through that particular test, which in my case is a very unique test that maybe almost nobody will go through. I hope so. <laughs> so it's, how to say, it's easy to, to share opinions without being empathic, without doing the, the, taking the time and doing the exercise actually entering there is like me telling a lady who just lost a pregnancy what she will do well i'm a male i don't know what does it mean to be a pregnant and to lose a baby mm -hmm. so sometimes that came from that place or sometimes again we we say okay if i will be in your position i will do it like that probably sometimes we, will, we may end up doing it even worse we never know until we are being put to test that's when we know who we are where we want to be mm -hmm. or even if some other people will have done that differently who say that there's only one correct way of doing things. We are all different and we maybe need to do things from different places. 
So anyhow, going back to the main timelines, but it's in connection to that. After Triple Rare Swami rejected me, you already know what happened till now. He rejected me publicly. <clears throat> and somehow he explained or justified the rejection by saying that I disobeyed, disobeyed him in, in terms of he told me to go to Argentina and, 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 and he and it is said that I didn't, I disobeyed that order, which of course, even if that will have been the case, if a guru rejects the disciple only because of that, it sounds a little exaggerated. But the point is that I didn't disobey him. I was planning to go to Argentina, but he told me to go to Argentina. He ordered me to do that if I want to remain his disciple. And after four days, he rejected me. So I was already in the organizing for going there, but it may take a few days to get the ticket and so on. So that's not true that I disobeyed that instruction. Also in his explanation of why he rejected me, he said that I conducted a campaign against him. As he said in other, with other, in other letter, me and other devotees did a conspiracy against him, which is again, not true, false. And he criticizes that my so-called disobedience was in Guru Seva, but the point is that there was no disobedience as I'm mentioning. And I, it was in Guru Seva, whatever I was doing, my inquiry, my actions were in trying to honor and serve those truths and example that I learned from him. And then came the accusation that may be one of the main points they hang to, like it was, it's because of Pratishta that I did what I did. And that's how to say, <laughs> that's a very easy accusation to make. You can say he has Pratishta and it's, you never know, it's very invisible and and how can you reply to such an accusation? If I say, no, I don't have Pratista, you may say, because you have Pratista, you are denying that you have Pratista. And if someone accuses me of Pratista and I say, yes, I conf then we say, okay, you confess that you have Pratista. So whatever you say, you will be confirming of, the, of that notion. <clears throat> but Pratista means position. Pratista in itself is not bad. Pratista is bad, the, the desire for position. But Pratista, I had a Pratista, in the sense of I had a position in terms of my position sincerely was I want to be a disciple. I want to be a good student. I want to serve my guru and my sangha. Those who know me <laughs> and who were near me during all that period knew that I was really committed in trying to do that to the best of my capacity. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I didn't do any mistake. But that was sincerely my stance. And Krishna knows how I, I prayed, how I cried a lot. And I may be crying now today, who knows <laughs> how I implore to him in this connection. Uh, <clears throat> and, and many devotees, again, were witnessed. First, they had first-hand experience of how I went through all this situation before I was rejected. And interestingly, all of those devotees who witnessed firsthand that process that I went through that month before being rejected, all of them choose to distance themselves from Tripura Swami because somehow I will say they knew what actually took place beyond what, what he mentioned as the actual so-called reason. So anyhow, after being rejected by Tripura Swami, um, and I, again, I'm saying all this is my timeline, my situation, but trying to hopefully you're able to go beyond my own situation and detect different templates and patterns that may pop up in other situations and know how to deal with them. So after the rejection uh, came a letter published, written by a disciple of Tripura Swami called Madan Mohan. And basically that was Tripura Swami's official stance in the situation that he himself said. So I, at one point I thought about replying to that letter and, and I had written, I saw the video, it was a video, not the letter, sorry. And I wrote many points to reply. But eventually I felt it doesn't, it's, I didn't feel like doing it. I felt, to be honest, that the, the video was very, uh, how to say, unsubstantiated, so to say. For example, in that video, I, I already before that did my own video, wrote my own letter with so many points and objective facts that happened that were not true, that were not clear. And none of them were addressed in that video. None of them, all of them were skipped. And all the main points that Madam Mohan concentrated on were actually not true. For example, he tried to emphasize that I threatened Guru Nistan, he even said that I threatened Tripura Swami. Well, actually, I never threatened any of them. Or that I engaged him, he suggested that I engage in dishonesty and blackmailing even, 
or but the interesting thing is that he said, and again, I'm not criticizing him and just pointing to these facts. He's, he began the video, I think, saying that, like, I don't know what's in the heart of Padmanabha Swami. I don't know what's in his mind. I don't know his inner intentions. But then he's, he gave a whole talk, assuming which were my intentions and motivations. So which is completely contradictory. If you don't know what's in my heart, how can you speak so much about what's in my heart? Mm -hmm. Or he also said in the video, I'm not saying with this that, Bhak that Padmanabha Swami is an apparati. But then after the first, first comment made to that video on YouTube and someone suggested that I was an apparati, he immediately confirmed that. So because of that, again, there is no much for me to say since in that video, since that presentation is mostly constituted by the speaker's own feelings and conjectures about what I did, but skipping all the clear objective true facts that I'm sharing and I've been sharing. Um, and also apart from that, Bhakti Rasa Dasi, she made a whole video, you may have seen it a whole year ago on that connection where she addressed the main points. But probably even worse <laughs> than, than this video, was the fact that Tripurari Swami was sending this video by private message to different people and, and, and saying, this is my official stance. I fully agree with what's being said this here. And some of that people Tripurari Swami was sharing that this video were my closest friends in Argentina, people that I've known and lived with for, for decades. And he will share that video to them by email. And I know that because they resend that to me. And in that they will, he will say this video fully represents my position and talking there about how my protista was big like a mountain and so on. And these friends know me for decades. You know, we know each other a lot. <laughs> and they know, basically they knew after reading that, that what Tripura Swami was saying was not true. So, but it was shocking for me to know that he was doing that. In other words, try to recapitulate for a minute, to be publicly and privately dismissed and downplayed by my former guru for those last months I was with him was bewildering enough for me. Then to have him speaking to others about me behind my back as being deviant, conspirator, traitor, abuser, and so on, that was even more bewildering. Then to have him disowning me as his disciple without any reasonable justification for that and doing that via Facebook and <laughs> not personally that was even more bewildering the Vimohan increased but now to to have him have him conducting a campaign of character assassination by portraying me as he did that was something that I will never have imagined to happen to be honest so I was in shock no? and again this is my case my situation but this, they are, these are also patterns that we can find anywhere. These are, these are templates that many of us may end up resorting in certain situations where we don't want to address some issues and so on. So as you know, then a few weeks later, many of my articles that I've written during some years in the Harmonist website were deleted uh, without me being notified of that, although the website itself said that that notification will be there. Some of the articles that were deleted also were quoted in my first book, Inherent or Inherited. So the links that I shared in my book was, were rendered obsolete because now those links were no longer working. Uh, and then on top of that, some other art articles were written in the Harmonist to justify Tripura Swami's stance after he rejected me. So those are a few things that happened after. Something also interesting that happened is that when, as you know, I was about to publish my book on Bhakti in the Jiva with the stance that Bhakti is not inherent and Brindaranya was in the process of writing her articles on Bhakti being both inherent and inherited and Tripura Swami being inclined to that direction. I asked him many times how to harmonize these two stances in our Sangha. And I asked him repeatedly concerned about how the rest of the Sangha will be harmonized in that situation. And he told me many times, that we can have both stances, no problem. We can accept that there may be two approaches to this, and we can ex ex express that open-mindedness. And I was perfectly fine. And I was open to learn from Brindarani's stance and even change my own. 
So this was what Tripura Swami told me, as well as he told other two devotees, at least that I recall in public conferences, talks he gave, that we can have these two stances. But to my surprise, after being rejected, I received an email that Tripura Swami's close disciple wrote to some other devotees saying that actually Tripura Swami never wanted the two stances. Actually, he wanted all of them to eventually, all of his disciples to eventually accept the new doctrine, so to say, Brindarani's stance and Bhakti being both inherent or inherited. Although he told me many times and other devotees that we could have those two stances. So somehow I felt, as you may imagine, also a little bit that there was some lack of honesty in that communication. So now some, some of Tripura Swami's followers also main argument for their rejection is that I demanded that Tripura Swami apologizes publicly. And for them, it was too much. But I actually mentioned, uh, I never demanded anything to begin with. <laughs> I mentioned that such a public apology, in the sense of they were, Brindarani was saying something inaccurate, Tripura Swami was fully supporting that, that created considerable disturbance in the whole Sangha. So I consider there is a place for acknowledging that mistake for, for that type of apology, and that will be healing. So my point is that. No, I, felt, I thought that a public apology will be humbling for the community. No, if you see your own guru acknowledging his mistakes, that will be moving, at least for me. <laughs> that was my thought. Now, and which problem should a guru have in acknowledging his own mistakes? A guru should be held accountable. If you are well situated and humble, there's no problem for that. So I never demanded that. So in other words, I thought that accountability could be something healthy, basically. I personally feel if I'm not held accountable, I will lose sobriety, basically. So yeah, accountability is something healthy. In fact, accountability or the lack of it generally is the single best predictor of long-term integrity in individuals and groups. This has been proved many times. Accountability is what keeps integrity in place. A lack of that, you know, the result of that. So the point is when a guru has zero accountability and presents himself as the only highest authority and nobody can question that because they will be rejected, as it happened in the situation I was in, basically, then that's very dangerous, in my opinion, at least. Mm. So, in fact, in re and, and in regard to my request for accountability, and again, not so much requesting a mere apology, what to speak of demanding that, but inviting for accountability. And as I've, I've noticed, I think in my, in my original letter, <clears throat> I said on, on the 28th of September last year, I say that when I spoke with Guru Nista, Rindarani's uh, husband, so I say that to Guru Nista, you know, that I thought that it will be good if they will present that apology or they will hold themselves accountable. That was said on the 28th of September last year. And after that, interestingly, one week after that, on the 5th of October, I have the messages, Tripura Swami told three different devotees on that same day that he had no intention of rejecting me. So you follow my point. If Tripura Swami had no intention of rejecting me after I quote unquote demanded that he apologize a week before, they why then why they present this so-called the mind of mine as the actual reason for his rejection? Mm -hmm. So again, for me, this type of thing show that there is no actual reason for the rejection, but somehow a reason has to be created to keep the false narrative going, basically. Mm -hmm. And, and unfortunately, Sri Purisami still is not resolving this situation in the sense of he is not acknowledging his part. He is not held accountable at all. He's basically putting all responsibility uh, on me, hmm? as I came to know from different devotees who heard that from him. So he's not taking any responsibility in this situation. And and unfortunately, as an extension of that, and that's one of the main points that I feel they're very delicate here, he basically do not accept relationship with peers, with brothers, with sisters that may speak to him uh, as on one-to-one -one level, speaks to him as equals, basically. He's not accepting this type of peer review. 
and that was what I was being told by many of the Prabhupada disciples who were and no longer are part of his mission, that all, all of them are his brothers and sisters. He always treated them as disciples. He never allowed this situation of peer review or equal. And therefore, if there are no peers, if there are no friends, basically, there are no feed, there's no feedback mm, from that place. Mm. And as we know, even in biological terms, nothing contributes more effectively to, to healthy evolution and growth than feedback. Mm. And, and by feedback, in this case, I mean learning how my own choices mm, and actions affect others. Mm. That's feedback. Hearing from them what, what's coming from me to them. So if, it's, if that's not present there in an authority figure, then again, we have a very dangerous, very fragile in its own way template. <clears throat> but I would say probably one of the biggest lessons, and again, happening in this situation, but then helping me to see how these same patterns are happening everywhere, let's say. One of the biggest lessons was for me to that due to what happened, I feel that in one way, after I was rejected, after I was ostracized, shunned, defamed, scapegoat, gaslighted, and so on, I feel that my situation was treated in Sri Chaitanya Sangha, the way my situation was treated was basically cultish, if you will. And why I'm saying cultish? Because you have all the main ingredients that generally make up for a cult or a potential cult or a cult on some level. First, you have one over-idealized and over-emphasized leader, over-absolutized person. And somehow, especially after Tripura Swami rejected me, somehow he over-positioned himself as such by lectures that I heard and so on. Then you also have one single narrative about a particular situation like mine. This is the official version. This is what actually happened. This is how you have to think about it. You have a common enemy, so to say, to create cohesiveness, union in the group. Let's make the whole group united by a common person we do not agree with. Hmm? You can imagine who was that person in this case. And then you have putting all those things together, the clear implication that if you disagree with all of this, basically you are out. I'm probably ostracized, scapegoat, defamed, and shunned like it happened to me. So this basically invites those who remain in the group, in that particular group, whatever it may be, to still remain there mostly out of fear, fear of being rejected, fear of losing one's tribe and friends and social circle, fear of not belonging, fear of losing potential, potential perks and benefit, fear, 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 <laughs> instead of deep trust, which will be the ideal way to belong not merely fit in. And this somehow reminds me of a list of biases that I shared in my book, which I find basically all of them quite operative, operative in this particular situation, and, and which can give us a glimpse when any potential situations of abuse can be happening. If these biases are exhibited by an overemphasized leader or by a silent crowd who is witnessing abuse without saying anything, or by both. Mm -hmm. So let, let, let me share this list briefly for those of you who have it here. So I'll read it for a moment. Different biases. And let's try to be honest and think those things may be in us, the potential cult may be in us, the potential abuse may be in us in our environment. So this is not about pointing to someone, but acknowledging honestly and humbling. It says, one of them is confirmation biased. The tendency to reject anything that doesn't fit in with our current understanding, paradigm, belief system, or worldview. Confirmation bias. Complexity bias. Our brains, our tendency to, to prefer a simple lie to a complex truth. Community bias, our tendency to reject any idea that will endanger our status in communities we belong to, to choose strive over truth. 
com complacency bias, our tendency to reject information that makes us uncomfortable, is inconvenient or disrupts our complacency. Confidence bias, our tendency to believe people who display confidence, rendering us susceptible to those who come on strong even when they are wrong including authoritarians and con artists. Conspiracy bias, our brain's tendency to believe stories that exonerate us or portray us as innocent victims or unsung heroes while vilifying an outgroup or individual real or concocted. Normalcy bias, our tendency to respond to dramatic catastrophes but easily miss compounding slow erosions of normalcy. Cash bias, our tendency to accept information that might interfere with our way of making a living. Not to accept, maybe to reject, sorry. So, as, I, as you can imagine by hearing my narrative before this list, I personally feel that basically all of this bias is played out in, in my personal situation in one way or another, whether from Tripurai Swami or from his followers. And, and by mentioning this, I'm not condemning them. I'm not condemning Tripurai Swami nor his current supporters, uh, nor anyone who may exhibit these biases, which again, probably I'm not free of them for sure. <laughs> so in fact, I'm mentioning these biases to somehow normalize them, not so much to condemn to stigmatize and the spirit of this presentation hopefully you can perceive that in between the lines is not only to point at certain things or people that have done certain things but after pointing to them also to normalize them to make to be honest and say probably we all have been through that on one level or another we will be not to normalize abuse i'm not trying to do that but to be realistic and acknowledge that most of us maybe indulging in some form of it. Since if we indulge in any of the above, bi above biases, and probably we do, <laughs> then the door for different forms of abuse mm, opens on some level. The door opens on some level. So the main problem here for me, at least, is not so much that these biases happen. They will happen. They may be happening but that these things happen and we don't acknowledge them. That's the real problem. Because they will happen and we have to learn from our mistakes, but the problem is when there is no acknowledgement. So there can be bias, there can be abuse, and that's in itself a problem for sure. But not recognizing those things and not being willing to do so on top of that, that can lead to even bigger forms of abuse. And the most dangerous template, in my opinion, in this regard, will be that someone commits a form of abuse, does not acknowledge it, and that such a person is surrounded by an, by, a, by an environment which silently witnesses something they know is not correct, but they do not say anything, they keep silent. That combination, someone doing abuse, even without knowing it is abuse, and they environment witnessing that in silence, that combination is the most dangerous of all, which will perpetrate and create further and further abuse till somehow hopefully the system collapses. <laughs> so in fact, totalitarian regimes, we could say that totalitarian regimes can thrive because people comply with them. People accept them silently. If you study the story of any totalitarian regime, recently I was watching a documentary on, on North Korea. You, maybe you already know about North Korea nowadays. That's basically a totalitarian regime. If you have a cell phone, the government is giving you, you cannot have Wi-Fi, you cannot know what's going on outside of the country, you cannot make international calls, you cannot travel from one state to the other without permission from the government, you, can, you cannot read any religious book, you can go to jail by that, <laughs> and so on. So... And of course, you hear that and you say, no, no, I don't want to be in North Korea. But if you don't want that, okay, great. But also understand that you can begin your own North Korea, so to say, by complying and by remaining silent. Mm -hmm. When we know things that are not, that, that something is going on that is not correct. And, and we remain silent because, again, of some of the above biases, because of convenience, 
security, comfort, complacency. And by doing that, we are creating indeed a little North Korea. Mm -hmm. So the way for this not to happen mm -hmm. is to basically brave, be brave enough to name and frame those issues that need to be pointed at. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's one of the main reasons that I wrote my book you know, on radical personalism, that I felt, okay, there are certain things that need to be name and frame. We need to find a language to talk about certain things, as we said before. <clears throat> and of course, in places like North Korea or any little dictatorship we may be building, even unconsciously, mm -hmm. Uh, in, in, in any of those situations, you will need a narrative to justify abuse. So it doesn't seem so. So it doesn't look like abuse. That's what you find also in all these systems. So sometimes it's, it's not so much how evil is the abuse, so to say, how evil is the abuse in itself, but how distorted is our narrative which through which we understand abuse, but we don't see it as such. Now, how distorted is our narrative, which indirectly, therefore, encourages abuse, even to people who may not be abusers themselves, themselves. But but if they enter into that narrative that is officially given, then the narrative takes them to abuse, so to say, on some level or another. They may be good people, as I already mentioned, but but the price of binding to that narrative, by doing that, you end up being an abuser yourself on some level. <clears throat> and again, the narrative may be presented in a very charming, heroic way, like in the Nazi regime. They will like present this idea, you, we, we, we are the Aryans, we want the purest race to populate and save the earth, and you have to protect yourself from the so-called germ of the Jews. And for some, that may have sound heroic and noble even, but it is actually hell, of course, it was. So my point is, if we do not talk... Hmm, then if we remain silently witnessing abuse, then we create a gaping silence. And that gaping silence is probably the worst of all compliance, basically. <clears throat> so again, despite all the pain uh, and how overwhelming the experience was, I'm totally grateful of what happened till such rejection and, and the whole things that happened after the rejection as I'm reflecting on took me by force of circumstance to, to a deeper place. Probably I wouldn't have gone without that forced situation, so to say. So it's not so much, I will say, preach a deep message and you will be rejected as it is, uh, be rejected and you will have a deep message, <laughs> a deeper vision hmm, of what's actually taking place. And I'm happy to, to, to acknowledge that I received that unique uh, perspective or viewpoint, you know, the viewpoint sometimes of the excluded one. <clears throat> There's one quote that I like to share, if you give me a minute, from Richard Rohr in this connection that I found recently and I found very connected to, to the situation I had been gone through. And that helps me a lot not to play the victim, but to remain grateful from witnessing situation from this unique viewpoint. So he says, let me read, he says like that, like this. <clears throat> it seems that until you are excluded from any system, you are not able to recognize the idolatries, lies, or shadow side of that system. There seems to be a structural blindness, quote-unquote, for people who are content and satisfied on the inside of groups. In other words, it's usually the outsider who can best recognize the real operative belief systems, security systems, and illusions of a group. The total insider is too comfortable inside to see the idols and self-serving systems of a country or an institution. End of the quote. So yeah, quotes like that help me to, to appreciate the point, the, the situation I've been in, like rejected or outcased, so to say. So anyhow, as I mentioned, during the last year, uh, which was the most painful and difficult one, I first had to be overwhelmed, angry, uh, and suffering a lot before being able to reach a place uh, of compassion, genuine compassion, although I want to be there from the day one. But to reach there, 
generally compassion, forgiveness, well-wishing. That took some time, but I'm glad to having gone through that and be where I ended. And to re after reached, having reached that place, I was, as I mentioned before, I, I was able to write an email to Tripura Swami a few months ago because after he la his last email he sent before rejecting me, I, I never... I didn't reply to that email because I never felt there was a, that was not an invitation for a conversation, basically. When he told me, like, if you want to remain my disciple, just go to Argentina and I have no long, no more service for you. But at the time, but I felt I have to, I want to close the circle. So I felt from this new place I've been in internally, I wrote an email to him expressing again that, of course, I still hold the same opinion I have from last year since what happened is what happened. <laughs> but also, uh, I felt very happy to be able to express to him my debt that I acquired to him, the gratitude that I feel for him and his Sangha, and how what I did in all this situation was sincerely out of love for him and his Sangha. And, and I know it, that was the case, and that's how I can sleep every night with my consciousness. I, have, I can be at peace with my pillow, so to say. <laughs> So, again, despite whatever happened and reaching my, the conclusion of this presentation, I am profoundly grateful. Uh, and for some, it, this may be paradoxical and difficult to understand. How can I, how can uh, you can consider a group somehow cultish on some level and at the same time learn from them and be grateful to them? But there is place for that. Again, things are not black and white. So let's become nuanced. And as I already said, what I've shared here is my own testimony, but I'm only using it to point to wider testimonies that I know that personally that I've witnessed firsthand happening throughout our Gaudiya communities, even with my first guru before Tripura so I have many similar patterns, as well as other communities at large. Uh, and as I already mentioned, and I want to mention it again because it's an important point, many of the most traumatic abuses uh, or traumatizing abuses were done by good people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who had unresolved human issues and were just unaware mm -hmm. that they were actually indulging in one form of abuse or another. So let's watch out for that mm -hmm. in others and in ourselves. Mm -hmm. And especially guru-disciple relationship, that's a template that if not addressed properly with care, it can lend itself a lot to this type of dynamics. Mm -hmm. Guru-disciple relationship, yes, is the most beautiful thing ideally but these cultish or abusive patterns that i've shared and many others of course can indeed happen and have happened and are already ha and are still happening in our communities so it's important that we remain discerning hmm, about those things so we can preserve this sacred relationship for what it is conceive it properly hmm. and not that we have codependency in the name of surrender pastoral abuse in the name of mercy or of divine authority or passing unresolved trauma in the name of parampara and so on. That's not the idea. <clears throat> and as you can imagine, all these situations that I've shared today and last year, and as you already may know, as well, and again, as the situation with my first guru, which I talked about at the time, all of this keep me reflecting. What else I can learn from them, how I can remain a student from of them in the sense of learning from what it happened with them. Because in one sense, my two gurus, Bhakti Alok from Advaita and Tripurari Swami, my, my two former gurus, I'll say, somehow they exhibited, of course, there are different situations. I'm not comparing them fully, but they exhibited similar patterns in terms of not accepting, exhibiting some form of abuse, not acknowledging that, not accepting feedback, not having basically friends and peers and somehow putting themselves or accepting putting themselves into some type of pedestal or bubble. Uh, I'm failing in some things. Again, broken agreements were their denial of taking every, any responsibility for their mistakes were there. Uh, so I wonder, okay, what if, if that happened twice to me, then I have to keep learning a lesson here <laughs> that I may, I, for me in particular, in my own case, to avoid that myself, or if I'm doing that, to stop me doing that myself. Because again, these two gurus that I had, both of them, as you may know, they were part of ISKCON at one point. And in part, they left ISKCON in part because 
they considered that the gurus at that time were too self-centered. Mm -hmm. But in one sense, they ended up doing basically the same. Mm -hmm. And of course, again, this happens in other sanghas as well. And I can end up doing exactly the same. So I have to remain vigilant for sure. So part of me opening my mouth during this hour and half it's publicly being open to commit myself that if this is happening to me, tell that to me. You know? Because this is not, again, trying to point to someone, trying to humiliate someone, trying to defeat someone, trying to prove someone wrong. It's trying to point to the possibility of these things happening, these templates happening anywhere. And to begin with, in me. There is the potential. We have the brightest potential. We have the darkest potential. Because these things can happen to anyone if we are not careful. And so I'm saying this again because if you happen to see something of that happening to me as a sannyasi, as a mentor, as a public figure, as a human being, as who I am, if I'm somehow doing this, please tell me. No? Because sometimes I maybe lose sight of things that are going on. And tell me, in, in, of course, I, I, I will expect that the telling will be in an honest way, in a clear way, in an empathic way. <laughs> That's how real conversations take place. But I want to be open to feedback, to peer review. And in, this, in that way, I want to be protected from myself, so to say. I remember that a few years ago in Brindavan, I did an ast a chart, astrological chart, because of my situation with health, specifically in epilepsy. Uh, so something came there, whether it's true or not, but I took it as true, it was instructing, it would say that in my previous life, I committed some violence to other people. And therefore, I, and now I'm having this epilepsy as a reaction, which of course, I accept that, let's honor that and deal with that in the best possible way. Hopefully, fortunately, it's not a very heavy case of epilepsy for those who didn't know that and, and getting concerned now. But my point is, I'm saying this here because I'm pointing to some point since those different types of abuse in my presentation today. Uh, I'm, although in this particular life, I think I haven't incur incurred in those types of abuse. Probably I did so in my previous life. Mm -hmm. And that's why probably I, I have to receive that from others in this lifetime, so to say. Probably, again, I'm not concluding about that, but I'm open to acknowledge that. Or probably, I, apart from doing it in the past, I may do it in the future. Mm -hmm. And I'm mentioning this so for you to help me to detect that in that case, so I can properly acknowledge and be forgiven and be redeemed and move forward. Mm -hmm. So again, I say all this as an attempt to humble my own statements. I'm sharing this astrological chart situation again and other things to humble my own words about others, so to say. And to make it clear that those same things that I'm talking about other people that I receive from other people in potential, it may happen to others, including me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so to conclude, of course, just in case, clarifying, I'm not here planning to take all this situation that I went through to the court, or I'm not planning to make a Netflix scandal, or, or I'm not planning even to post a yearly anniversary video on this topic. <laughs> uh, and that's why also I've posting these videos in all my in the different platforms I'm doing without allowing for comments. Because I don't want this to be a whole thing, and I will be the whole month outside of social media in Kartik. So I'm not trying to create those types of dynamics. I just feel the need to express these points. <clears throat> and of course, whomever may like to communicate with me in private for whatever reason in this connection, we can speak after Kartik about whatever you may need. And of course, those not interested in watching this video, you can cancel this video right now if you want. But I personally feel the need to share these words to bring further closure to my own experience and hopefully bring further closure to other people who have been involved in this situation, uh, like Tripura Swami himself or the mem other members of Sri Chaitanya Sangha. If this helps them for further closer closure, I will be happy to know that. That's my intention starting for me uh, because again as I've, I have been redeemed considerably by this complex situation and of course by Krishna's grace who came to my life in the form of this complex situation it is also my desire that others may also be equally redeemed or others going through similar situations whether in the past present or even future 
may find hope, may find clarity uh, and relief <clears throat> in some of the words I'm sharing. So my own traumatic experience and now healed and redeemed experience may be somehow further justified, may have some meaning and purpose not only for me. <clears throat> and since also part of this presentation is to share some reflections and reports of where I am after one year of what happened, so where I am at present in terms of Guru Tattva, which I know has been a question that many have had and they share with me. And I must, I must confess that I've been surprised that some people think or thought that if any guru rejects any disciple, then the disciple is always at fault. It's always the wrong part. Mm -hmm. So they immediately assume, oh, your guru rejected you, then you are a rejected one. You, you must be wrong in something. Uh, so yeah, it surprised me you know, that some people immediately label you as a deviant or as an outcast without even considering uh, how genuine were the reasons for the actual rejection. So in my particular case, as I've tried to show, uh, I was rejected by not allowing further abuse. That was the actual reason why I was rejected. I was not rejected for any of the actual reasons, the official reasons that were presented. I was rejected actually by not allowing further abuse, by preserving my integrity and values and principles and by, by choosing truth, actually over blind submission. The result of doing that, it was I was rejected. So, so how much was I actually rejected by Guru, by Sri Guru, by Guru Tattva, which is the very department of truth itself, how much I was rejected by it, or by him, by me choosing to stick to truth as much as I could and not otherwise. So on the, on the contrary, for me to take the stance that I took, helped me to even go deeper, as I already mentioned, to go even deeper into all that Guru Tattva represents, to find a deeper layer, to find Guru Tattva in a deeper way. Mm -hmm. So now at present, I don't feel myself without Guru, without the connection with the Parampara, with our Acharyas. I don't feel that I have been rejected by Guru Tattva, by Krishna, who is the Adi Guru. I don't feel lack of mercy, lack of shelter, lack of inspiration. Uh, and of course, I'm open. I'm not saying all this like a justification to not connect with any sadhu in my life, in the rest of my life, more officially as my guru. I'm open to that if Krishna wishes so. But also I'm open that if Krishna wants me to keep me in this weird, awkward position, I mean, so to say, to render some service from that particular situation, and he wants me to remain there for the rest of my life, if that of some service and he wants that, that's his will. I'm open to do that as well. Again, I don't feel there is a lack uh, of shelter and mercy and inspiration and connection in this particular situation. Mm -hmm. So in conclusion, again, after one year of being rejected by Tripura Swami, here I am, deeply grateful for what I've received. Uh, and I still, again, have affection for the people I'm pointing to here in this video. You know, in fact... <laughs> If you love someone, you will speak strongly about them. If, if something is wrong and you want them to be redeemed from that. So that's actually the background to that. I still have affection and love for Tripura Swami and his Sangha, despite differences and, and distance that may continue or not, I don't know. But nonetheless, I want to make these points clear again. Since beyond the situation itself that I've gone through, I make this point clear since we humans tend to forget some of the things or sometimes we take them lightly, hmm? or sometimes even normalize, as I mentioned, subtle but equally damaging forms of abuse in our communities. Hmm? So as the famous adage, as this famous saying goes, yes, always forgive, but never forget. Hmm? So here's the video. I've been lots of days thinking, should I, should I do the video? Should I don't do the video? As I, mean, as I mentioned before, should I record this? What's the best way to express my present situation? What's the best way to express, to extend compassion and well-wishing and create healing in others, somehow to convey my own healing to others? Should I do it or not? So I've tried to pray and allow time, alchemy to show me what's best. And some may think that I'm great, that if I'm grateful with Tripura Swami, I should express that by not saying these things, by being silent. And while I respect that, that someone may feel like that, 
uh, in my case, I concluded that the best way to express my gratitude, my love, compassion, and healing is sharing these words with you uh, and with the hope you know, of helping not only the involved parties as well as myself, but in bringing further honest closure to this chapter, hopefully that happens, but also helping those uninvolved uh, parties, but which may use my testimony as a general template that may provide them with further discernment in case they go through similar situations. So in summary, just before closing this streaming, for us to have healing, for us to have change, First, there have to be acknowledgement mm, and addressing of whatever needs to be healed. Mm. And even if outside this can be seen as an accusation, for some people it may be seen as such, what we are actually trying to do here is to mm, <clears throat> point to those things that need to be addressed so we can obtain genuine healing. We all need healing. Mm. And that's what I wish to, to all of us, mm, to me, to you, to all of us, redemption, and healing by acknowledging the truth. And then I wish the natural moving forward that only comes as a result of that. So anyhow, I've tried to be as this I've tried to be as discerning and sincere as possible in making this presentation. For sure it's not free of faults. So in advance I apologize for that and I remain willing to and open to receive empathic feedback hmm, from whomever considers to share it. And in advance, I apologize for any anxiety that I may have created by these words or by anything else that I may have done in the past. And I wish you may have a very blessed month of Kartik, full of prayer, full of integrity, full of mercy. Hmm. Kartik Brat Ki Jai Sri Radha Thakurani Ki Jai. Shri Satchinandan Gaur Hari Ki Jai, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Ki Jai, Gaur Primanam Hari Bo, Pancha Kalpa Taru Vyascha Kripa Sandhu Vyai Vacha, Patita Anam Pavani Vyavashna 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 Vyavashna